My late husband, who had Alzheimer's for 11 years, um, was um, also um, a professor uh, in the English department at the University of Connecticut and wrote um, a very inc uh, incredible memoir, thank goodness, um, some years before the onset of his disease. And when, he, when we knew that he was forgetting um, and um, moving probably into Alzheimer's because his mother had had it, um, I knew that I would be taking this journey, a very intimate journey with him. Um, and so the poems that um, resulted from my taking the journey with him um, and uh, are in a way first-hand experiences, but of course the first-hand was his experience and he couldn't write about it, much less um, talk about it at times. Um, so this is very much a kind of um, way of imagining it, some of the poems. Uh, uh, some of the poems document and wi are witness. Others um, involve imagining what it may, might have been like for him. I'm going to be begin with a poem called Some Questions. When did you first notice, the doctor asks. The doctor gives you three words to remember, apple, table, penny. He shows me the clock you've drawn, the hour and minute hands reversed. Count back by seven from a hundred, he demands. What does any of it matter, you counter? Give me a real question. If mind is a hidden hermitage, a dark wood, who can track a disease that sieves the mind of its contents? Who is present for that first subtle tremor, that too much or too little of who knows whatever it is allows seepage or surfeit in the brain? Tell me, when does the tempest begin? When the first splash splatters the windshield? Or when unnoticed, Sunfire lifts a stipule of moisture off a stalk, pulls it into the traceless, then slurs into cirrus and cumulus, darkening counsel and mood, giving rise to windy thoughts. You're doing great, the doctor soothes. Now, what were those three words I gave you? Do you remember? And here it is, the driving rain, a roiling that lathers the pond, and we're drenched in cause and effects, each of us caught off guard, out in the open, wet to the bone. Forgetting. Hay sent fern in one window pane, in another pane, rhododendron, red barn siding. You're staring out the west window as if what you see out there might wake the inner word you want, that fugitive, unfaithful word wed now to silence. As we wait, I try to imagine your brain as a window fitted with white squares of mist, then frost, then snow thickening on one pane, on another, and another. Slowly the ferns vanish, scent and root, and now I blank out the several panes that frame two oaks and a rope hammock, a void where once were form and fragrance, tall trees, and the faint pattern of braided rope, an impression printed on my firm thighs and onto the smooth underskin of your arms after we'd slept there barely an hour, suspended in sunlight. As I'm sure you all know, um, Alzheimer's is not simply um, a disease of forgetting language. Um, many other skills um, are are forgotten. Um, <laughs> one that I um, hope is not too telling, I um, 
go, oh, I misplace things. Does anyone else in the audience? <laughs> But with Alzheimer's, um, this becomes a major misplacement. <laughs> um, and I'm going to read you a poem now called Losing It. It sometimes would take us an hour to get out of the, out of the house. Um, it took that long to find things so that we could leave intact. So, Losing It. What little I know, I hold more dear now that I take the daily reinvention of loss as my teacher. I will never graduate from this college whose MA translates Master of Absence with the subtext in the imperative, misplace anything. You were the one renowned among friends for your luck in retrieving from the wayside the perfect bowl for the kitchen, a hand-carved deer, a pencil-drawn portrait of a young girl whose brimming innocence still makes me ache. Now the daily litany of losses goes like this. Do you have your wallet? Keys? Glasses? Gloves? Giraffe? Oh dear, I forgot my giraffe. That's the preferred response. But no, it's usually the glasses, the gloves, the wallet, the keys I've hidden. And when I get frantic, when I've lost my composure, my nerve, my compassion, I have only what little I know to save me. Here's what I know. It's not absence I fear, but anonymity. I remember taking a deep breath, stopped in my tracks. I'd been looking for an important document I had myself misplaced, high and low, no luck yet. I was beside myself, so there may have been indeed my double running the search party. Stop, you said gently. I'll go get Margaret. She'll know where it is. But I'm Margaret, I gasped. No, no. You held out before me a copy of one of my books, pointing to the author's photograph. You know her, you said. We looked into each other's eyes a long time. The earth tilted on its axis, and what we were looking for each other and ourselves took the tilt, and we slid into each other's arms, holding on for dear life, holding on. Okay. One more um, in, the, in this vein, uh, a poem called Champleur. It's a French word. Um, I encountered, and the poem will tell you what it means. Champleur. Maybe you already know. <laughs> Champleur. This morning, the little new is a word I speak haltingly. Champleur. Quick now, before it's lost in the swell of wind as the pines around our house billow and rain drills the roof, say it. Champleur. Again. Champleur. Hear it. Let it course down your face. Champleur. A compound noun that yokes song with the act of weeping. A noun is a verb that holds still, that settles in one place too long and casts a spell of apparent permanence. We think we're nouns, but really all I have to offer is champleur. A word as impermanent as the touch of rain on my skin. A word minted by one who has heard the wordless song of the wind, by one who sings and hears within herself a blended sound, a disthong for the lyric river pulsing in her wrist, a river wrested from what no one wants to hear. We're losing him. He's fading away. He's not himself. He's slipped through the rip in the mist. He's with us and not. With us and not. Champleur. Just look. He moves his hands like birds as he speaks. Every blessed word, a winged migration. Flowing, flown. Champleur. 
Bruce talked about the hippocampus and with, um, without it functioning correctly said that we were, one was, um, lost in, or trapped in the present. Um, I've been a Zen student for a long time and I would love to stay in the present more solidly than I do. Um, and it was actually my Zen practice that helped me tremendously as a caregiver because if I went back to the past too often, I would feel sorry for myself, I would feel all sorts of grief, and you can't function so well that way. When you, If you go too far in the future, there's fear and all, all of its uh, various accompanying emotions. Um, so staying in the present was a great boon, and my Zen practice was a great boon too. Um, this next poem I'm going to read is a longer one. It's called Sentences. Um, and it takes as part of its concern, or in the background of some of its concern, is the question, who are we anyway? What is identity? What are we? Um, are we only our stories? Um, and another kind of another question which fascinates me is, and the scientists aren't going to like to hear this one, is it terrible not to know? So, sentences. I'll pause between some of the sections. Sentences to David. I have a friend who thinks it's terrible there are no answers. He doesn't believe in God because God would be an answer one could know, and we don't know. I say he believes without knowing he believes, he scoffs at that, and I think to myself, the root of believe is to hold dear, therefore to live with caring. I admit I'm stretching the root, but my friend lives as if he's taken Pascal's wager. He paints stroke by stroke. He wagers. He creates a world. Theoretical physicists believe there are six flavors of quarks. Their names are up, down, strange, charm, bottom, and top. They believe this. They eat breakfast. They go for walks inside the landscape of an electron. But you, my beloved, who forget that you forget, and who make beautiful sense of the world, would dismiss such cogitations. You would focus on the sheer joy of one breath, this one breath. If I identify with what stays, I am one thing. If with what flows, another. I am a river in disguise. A river knows that place and once are not fathomed, plumbed, or tallied. When I stand at the edge of Main Brook and watch the snow melt sweeping around the prow of stone upright in the cascading torrents, I am of one mind. When I straighten up, having lifted and lightly balanced mossy stones to make a cairn, I am of one mind. When I bow before the tree, whose roots slide over a shoulder of granite jutting out of the earth, whose roots hold the stone steady, flowing past it and embracing the stone, disappearing into the dark source that makes all words one, I am of no mind. Is it so terrible not to have answers? I grant you it's terrible to lose one's mind as burst of light by burst of light the neurons misfire, unable to reach across synapses, making run-on sentences, eroded fragments, tangles. In the metaphor of eclipse, the mind is shadowed, no ricochet of radiant protons graces its surface. Where did you grow up, you ask me? My story. You knew it once. Yours, too. Now you read your memoir more moved than when you wrote it. The story's fresh, immediate, your depth of feeling no longer held in check by intellect. You read the sentences your lifelines, amazed. 
Is it in your DNA, perhaps? A coded sentence. You will, like your mother before you, be asked to let go of all you hold dear. Our friend picks up his paintbrush. You put down your pen. Think of Sisyphus, condemned to accomplish nothing, sentenced to toil uphill to that resting place when the stone crests and settles, tilts and tumbles down. What is his mind at that moment? I keep wanting you to tell me what you remember, what you know and do not know, as the stone rolls, as the river flows, as the root sinks deeper as is its way out of sight. Eclipsed, the moon goes dark, but the moon is still there, a deep presence held in place, disguised as an eddy in the river. These metaphors, I believe. Up, down, strange, charm, bottom, and top, hums the chorus in the background as Oedipus, that beautiful man, snow-haired at Colonus, says openly, all is well. And you, who were memory scribe, this is what now you say. I have been lucky. I have been lucky all my life. One thing that I don't have time to read to you um, are some poems that focus on what that luck might be. Um, it was, despite all the odds and despite all of my fears and his fears, his illness was um, a factor, I think, in bringing us closer to each other. Um, and there were things that became deeper and more beautiful, but I think in part because of the Alzheimer's, but maybe something else. I don't know what that word would be. Thank you.